Support for UWTV is provided by the Boeing Employees Credit Union. In the aftermath of trauma or disease, there may be more to healing than just survival. An accident, a virus, or cancer can change not only how we function, but how others see us and how we feel about ourselves. Getting back to who we were can be as important as regaining our health. I don't want to go out there and see people that I know. That my family and my close friends, I'm okay with that. It's, it's uh, going out in public uh, with people that she used to know. Well, they, I don't think they'd recognize her anyway. A lot anyway. of people did not recognize her. But I lost a lot of weight, and my face is a little bit different. Kirsten Ivasevich had encephalitis, an acute inflammation of the brain. It put her into a coma, and it damaged many of her cranial nerves. Her speech was affected, her swallowing was affected. Um, and she's had fairly good recovery of function, a lot of the nerves, except for the facial nerve. She had absolutely no, no recovery of the facial nerve. So her, her face was uh, totally immobile. Um, her lower lip drooled because uh, there was no muscle tone to hold her mouth closed. I mean, I never really saw a difference in her because it never bothered me. But you see so many people that are... Um, sorry that are very superficial and they see a difference. She was the same person inside, but Kirsten's facial paralysis affected her severely. She couldn't blink, couldn't smile, couldn't speak clearly enough to be understood by most people. She could barely swallow and had to use a feeding tube. She lost a lot of weight, but not her sense of humor. You see all these shows on TV about losing the weight. I want to gain weight. And I tell them, don't take all that stuff. Go to the feeding tube. <laughs> yeah. You'll live right. Kirsten's sister Mia is a head and neck cancer surgeon in Minneapolis. She researched surgical options for Kirsten and discovered Dr. Peter Nelligan, an internationally known specialist in microvascular reconstruction. He had just accepted a position as director of the Center for Reconstructive Surgery at the University of Washington Medical Center. So I just emailed Dr. Nelligan briefly, you know, one paragraph and boom, within a day, he emailed me back and said, uh, we'll continue this conversation, but do nothing because I'm in the process of going to Seattle. And that's how it all came about. I think she's great. A fantastic, big side manner explains everything, exactly what he's going to do. He's never in a rush. Always takes time for you. And he makes me feel very comfortable. So Kirsten and her husband Jim came to Seattle as well. About six months ago, Dr. Nelligan operated on the right side of Kirsten's face. Now she's back for surgery on the left side. Hey, how are you? I'm great, how are you doing? Good. Awesome, look at that. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's spectacular. What we did uh, at her first operation was to transfer a muscle from her leg to her face and connect it to a nerve that normally works the, the masseter muscle. The masseter muscle is one of the muscles that we use to clench our teeth. And so now, in order to activate the new muscle, she clenches her teeth and the muscle moves the corner of her mouth. So we're now going to do the same operation on the other side and transfer the muscle from her leg to her other cheek connected to the masseter nerve on that side, so she'd be able to smile, she'd be able to animate her face. With practice, Kirsten should eventually be able to smile without actually clenching her teeth. Already, with the new muscle on only her right side, there's a difference. Her laugh has changed a good bit. It's a, it's a quieter laugh. You can see the laugh. It, it, the smile is starting to be formed now. but. Um, her, uh, you, you, the only way you knew she was in a good mood before is if you saw her eyes. 
him be in her eyes. That's how you can read her. Now, now you're starting to get some facial expressions. Kirsten doesn't drool on her right side anymore, and swallowing food is becoming possible again. Her biggest thing is food. Food is just, our family loves food. <laughs> Um, and the fact that uh, she, she couldn't eat there for a while was pretty hard on her. She just, uh, she wanted to do a lot more. And now she can. And she will be able to do more. It's really worked wonders. It really has. And it's given me a lot of self-confidence. How are you doing? I'm nervous. You are nervous. That's all right. I'm not, so that's okay. Dr. Nelligan is one of a handful of surgeons in the country who perform this complex facial procedure. You become fascinated by it because it's just very cool to be able to, you know, take a piece of tissue from one place and put it to another and fix a major problem that, you know, is otherwise not fixable. Okay, just smile for me. Big one. During this second surgery, Dr. Nelligan will transplant another leg muscle to the left side of Kirsten's face. In her first procedure, he also took a tendon from Kirsten's arm and inserted it under her eyelids to stop them from drooping. Very small gold weights placed in her eyelids enable her to blink. Today, Dr. Nelligan will make some adjustments around her eyes. The eyelid will just be the same incision as before, okay? And what I'm going to try and do is to get the, to reposition the one. The one on the right is fine. I'll just put a heavier weight in. Okay. And on the left, will that one's too low down, so I'm going to lift it up a little bit so that it's not as noticeable. Okay. Surgeons at the Center for Reconstructive Surgery are focused on restoring function, but there's an aesthetic element as well. Some of the techniques that are used in cosmetic surgery will use in reconstructive surgery. So, for example, where we're putting muscle into somebody's face, the incision I use is the same incision that I would use if I was doing a facelift on somebody. So the whole idea is to try and hide the scars in the, exactly the same way as a cosmetic surgeon is going to try and hide the scars. That's really one of the fun parts about plastic surgery is that oftentimes, you know, you impact people in such a positive way in that the patient who's, you know, had a facial paralysis and you can restore, you know, the ability to smile or a patient who's had uh, lost a breast, you're able to restore the shape and form of the breast for that patient or you know, a patient who has other complex wounds that are so, just something that's been causing them problems for a long period of time, and then you can figure out a plan to get it to heal and um, function you know, relatively normally, I mean, that patient's very appreciative and every, you know, it's, a, it's a really rewarding part of the, of the surgery. So I've got all my stitches in right now, uh, where the muscle's gonna go, so I have four stitches in, and these stitches are in her native facial muscle. So that's where I'm gonna stitch my muscle too. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the blood vessels and the nerve ready. Yes. Sometimes a patient needs reconstruction after cancer surgery or after a traumatic injury such as a gunshot wound. Sometimes a birth abnormality needs to be repaired. With any reconstructive surgery, there are almost always emotional issues as well as medical ones. And I think that's why it, you know, a lot of times it takes a certain amount of time to really discuss the options with the patient who's had either a very significant injury or a diagnosis of cancer, you know, or a congenital deformity that they've just kind of lived with for a long period of time, is that there is a lot of emotional uh, issues surrounding that, you know, that problem, and that you have to recognize those as well in order to sort of get down to what's going to be a successful reconstruction. Each patient and each surgery is unique. Reconstructive surgery requires an extensive knowledge of anatomy on the part of the surgeon. In order to be able to do this surgery, you need to know where you can get tissue from. And not only do you need to know where you can get tissue from, but you need to know what the blood supply of that tissue is. Because basically what we're doing is taking a chunk of tissue with its blood supply, bringing it someplace else, and then reconnecting that blood supply to a blood supply in the area that we're reconstructing. So in order to do that, we have to know where all this plumbing is. So you need to know your anatomy very well, all over the body. Dr. Nelligan has transplanted the muscle from Kirsten's leg to her face. As he connects the vessels, blood begins to flow through them. So you can hear that noise, it's the vein, so it's working fine. So, next thing we do is the nerve. Kirsten's face won't be the same as it was before her illness, but now that Dr. Nelligan has operated on both sides of her face, she'll be able to do the things that most of us take for granted. I think the nice thing about this is, um, you get functional results as well as cosmetic results. We can give her 
uh, enough function that she can smile. Um, we can give her enough function that she can uh, hold her mouth closed so that she can eat in public. So hopefully when we do the second muscle, then you know her speech will improve significantly so that she can at least be understood. And then if we give her some enough tone that her face looks normal, we're trying to replace you know all of these facial muscles with one muscle on each side. So we're not going to give her normal function, but we can give her some semblance of normal function. And that's exactly what Kirsten and her family are looking forward to. So, everything went well. Good. Um, no, nothing not anticipated. Everything was fine. Okay. Muscle was nice. The uh, nerve was nerve was good. Stimulated well. Her okay. masseter nerve was good. Nice vessels. I was very pleased with where we got Nasal the suture placement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you'll see when you see her. She's got a nice nasal labial fold. Okay? Okay, thank you Great. so much. Thank you so, so much. See you Sorry. over the next couple of days. Valerie Pingle's annual mammogram brought bad news. I went in for my physical and went and got my yearly mammogram and like the day that I got the mammogram, he called me within two hours on a Friday afternoon and I'm like, okay, you know, no doctor calls you on a Friday afternoon. She has cancer, and the best option for treatment is a mastectomy to remove her entire breast. The cancer is too diffuse for a lumpectomy. And when you look at it, like on the, the mammograms, or it, it almost looks like somebody took a salt shaker and kind of sprinkled salt on the lower part of my breast and then up on the side. So, it's, so you could see that it wasn't just one lump, and you could see why uh, the choice had to be to take off the whole breast. Valerie had many questions about both her surgery and her reconstruction options. She asked doctors and friends, but it was a procedure she found on the internet that most intrigued her. Her research on that procedure sent Valerie and her husband to the University of Washington Medical Center. Dan and I were just like amazed from the get-go. It was absolutely incredible. Dr. Mann came in, who's going to be our general surgeon, and he was just like really nice to us, talking to us, explaining the whole thing to us. And then Dr. Saeed was coming in afterwards. Come here, sit. Valerie chose to have both breasts removed, based on a family history of breast cancer and her own fibrous breast tissue. And from the beginning, she planned her reconstruction with Dr. Hakim Saeed. He was absolutely great. And when he was showing me pictures of before and after um, surgeries that he's done and explaining everything to me about what he was going to do, I felt very comfortable. I think every patient has sort of a unique set of priorities and preferences that will dictate what, what's right for her. And um, if you go to a center that only provides one of those methods, then maybe it's more difficult to, to tailor it to the patient. But if you provide the whole gamut of, of options, then you can really talk to the patient about uh, what her preferences are, what her needs are, what her priorities are, and, and really individualize the solution for the patient. Dr. Saeed is one of the Center for Reconstructive Surgery's team of physicians. These surgeons work closely with other clinical areas to offer the full spectrum of care to patients. It's a multidisciplinary team, so typically for a cancer case, uh, one surgeon will do the cancer resection, removing the cancer, and then we will come in and do the reconstruction. You get to interact with a lot of different specialties, and so, you know, I do cases with the general surgeons, with the surgical, surgical oncologists, orthopedic surgeons, the, you know, guy oncologists. We're reconstructing lives, so it's not just the body part that we're putting back together, but that's a very important part of the whole rehabilitation of the patient who's just come through a, a, not only cancer, but possibly deformity associated with the cancer. Dan and I both got the sense that these guys know what they're doing. You know, we both got, and, and not only do they know what they're doing, but they, they kind of, they care. You, you just got a sense of, you know, not only am I going to do this job for you, but I kind of hear what you're saying and what's important to you. That support is crucial for patients who are already under a great deal of stress. Before her surgery, Valerie had some moments of fear, both about her surgery and about how it might affect her relationship with her husband. Those fears all came to a head one day. 
-hmm. There's a huge amount of the insecurity that I think goes along with it that you kind of hide and then it, it came out that day. You know, it's like, oh, is he still going to love me? You know, am I going to look okay? Am I going to be okay? Um, and, and luckily, Dan, he's great. He just listened to me for like six hours off and on. So, King, there's a beautiful medial one on the left. So we'll take the right side lateral. So right lateral, left medial. That sounds great. The procedure that attracted Valerie to the University of Washington Medical Center involves using her own abdominal tissue to replace her breasts, rather than a manufactured implant. When we use an implant for breast reconstruction, the implant is providing the volume that will restore the, the shape and the fullness of the breast. Um, but an implant is not a natural tissue. It has its own constraints. It has a shape. It has a, a form. And, and it doesn't really match natural tissues in a lot of ways. Whereas if you use your own tissues to rebuild a breast, really the characteristics of that tissue are the closest match we have for the, the fat and the, the breast tissue that's removed. Another advantage to this procedure is that a patient's own tissue will last the rest of her life, requiring no maintenance or replacement later on. Another beautiful vessel you can see here. Blood vessels are carefully transferred with the rest of the tissue, then reconnected to vessels in the chest. The tricky part is taking enough blood supply at the time of the surgery. Once the blood supply is established and everything is healed, you never have to do anything again because it's part of you, it's durable, and it regenerates. To me, that's so cool that it's, it's going to be all my own. It's pretty organic in a way, it seems to me. Because it's her own tissue, Valerie will eventually regain some feeling in her breasts. Nerves do grow into the site if it's your own tissue, so sensation gradually returns to the breast. Valerie's double mastectomy and reconstruction are being performed almost simultaneously. As Dr. Mann removes her breast tissue, Dr. Saeed and Dr. Nelligan are acquiring the replacement tissue from her abdomen. If we can provide an immediate reconstruction psychologically, that's a tremendous boost for women. In addition to that, there's really no way of recapturing a lot of the details that we can reconstruct if we can go right in at the time of the mastectomy. Once the breast tissue is removed, the skin is supple and soft, and a lot of details to create a natural looking breast uh, are really best done right then and there. If I can get it from this side if you want. Yeah, that'd be good. Dr. Saeed and Dr. Nelligan are sharing the procedure because Valerie is having both breasts reconstructed at once. The team approach means less time in surgery, which lessens the risk for patients. It's actually a tremendous advantage to have a second surgeon working at the same time, particularly if there are two breasts to reconstruct because each of us can work on one side of the abdomen. This is our half of our lower abdominal flap. And you can see we've, uh, we've isolated into a triangle that will turn to create the new right side breast reconstruction. And we've isolated on one blood vessel that we found. And you can see, there it is. This is a, this is a pretty impressive pulsating uh, blood vessel which is perfusing this entire piece of tissue. And of course that's really the challenge is to find the right blood vessels as they course through. So we really have to hunt those down and each of us can do that at the same time. That teamwork comes into play outside of the operating room as well as the physicians share their knowledge. Uh, David and Hakeem and I worked closely together. Monday, David, uh, Hakeem helped me with the case. Uh, last week I helped him with the case. Uh, frequently, you know, we'll call each other into each other's rooms, say, what do you think of this? What should I do with that? So there's a lot of stuff that gets bounced back and forth. Even though you're seeing one surgeon, you really get the, uh, the brain trust of three surgeons and uh, that is to everyone's advantage. Reconstructive surgery requires both experience and an ability to be innovative. To be a successful reconstructive surgeon, the most important underlying thing is you have to have a sort of a combination of the, a keen understanding of the anatomy of the areas you're working in, as well as I think you need to have some sense of artistry. And then you certainly need certain technical skills, you know, which include being comfortable working under the microscope, uh, as well as comfortable just working on you know, various areas. And I think you also need to have an ability to improvise when necessary. Sometimes we're just asked to come in the operating room and come up with a plan you know, right there and then and fix it. And, um, and that's where it's you know, very advantageous to have your uh, colleagues as well, because you can always call upon them for any advice. And uh, I think that that helps as well. Oftentimes, you'll do an operation that you've never done before. 
um, you may never do it again, but for that particular patient, it was the best operation. And knowing the anatomy and knowing where everything is, you can do it safely. Tissue-based breast reconstruction has been performed since the 1980s, but originally it involved taking a muscle from the abdomen as well, weakening that area of the patient's body. And then in the 90s, people discovered that you could actually dissect out those little blood vessels and leave all of the muscle behind, which is what we're doing now. The blood vessels keep Valerie's tissue alive as it's taken from her abdomen. After the transfer, blood vessels in the abdominal tissue are connected to vessels in Valerie's chest. The little veins are being held in place by this little device. And the two sides are going to be opposed. They'll interlock. There's a series of little holes, and they fit tightly into the little holes on the other side. So there are two rings. OK, let's close. Snap, mosquito. OK, see you guys? So we're bringing the two ends together, and the little ends. And then you squeeze it for a final little confirmation. And then it comes out, and I exit. And the vein is hooked up now. This microsurgical technique is still not widely available. This is going to be slid into the pocket. There are a number of breast reconstruction options that are more advanced than uh, most centers would provide. And Peter Nelligan's expertise really as a cutting edge surgical innovator means that we can provide those options. Uh, going to, to a place where all of those options are available means you have the best chance of finding an option that's best suited for you. Uh, so you're not limited to only the first option that you hear about. So the plan today is to build a nipple, as we've talked about in the past. So the nipple has a couple of elements to it. There's the raised tab in the middle, and there's the differently colored skin on the periphery. That's called the areola. So the papule is what we'll be building today, and the areola we tattoo on later. Rayona Humphreys has completed the first stages of her breast reconstruction. Her initial surgery was the same as Valerie's, followed by some fine tuning to make her new breast match her non-surgical side. When you have a mastectomy, the first thing we address usually is the fullness, the volume, and the contour of the breast. It looks a little lower, but... If we're only addressing one breast, often we do symmetry work to match the other breast. So if you need a lift on the other side, we would do that usually too. Uh, and then later on, once, once the shape is established and everything is well healed, then we would add a nipple and we would tattoo a nipple as well. Look very stylish in those sunglasses. To reconstruct a nipple, Dr. Saeed is using Rayona's skin from a flap that was left during her original surgery. He'll leave the skin attached at one point to maintain a healthy blood supply. You can see sort of the bow tie effect. It looks like a little bow tie of skin. I'm going to pick it up and fold it around on itself. The skin is folded in on itself to make it project from the breast. Over the next few months, it will flatten out a little bit, so during this procedure, Dr. Saeed will make it somewhat larger than Rayona's other side. But it does look awful lot like a nipple all of a sudden, doesn't it? Later, when Rayona has healed, she can have a tattoo to recreate the look of the areola. If you're missing a nipple and missing an areola, it's hard to look at it and call it a breast. But once those finishing details are there, people really kind of look at it and, and forget that something is, is, has been removed. And that's sort of ultimate, our ultimate goal, is to get enough details in there that it all clicks and, and you're looking at a breast again. Surgeons at the Center for Reconstructive Surgery are involved in research that will enhance patients' options in the future. Dr. David Mathis has a particular interest in the immunology of transplantation, working on research in Dr. Rainer Storb's lab at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. The ultimate goal in reconstruction is to replace like with like and to really return wholeness to the patient and give them back the tissue that they've lost. And oftentimes this can be done with tissues from other parts of the body. I think you know, a good example is breast reconstruction, that over time we've refined our abilities. And I think that we do a fairly good job of reconstructing the breast with tissue, for example, from the abdomen. But when you get to more specialized tissues such as the lips or the nose, eyelids, or just really a complex unit like the hand, those really can't be easily reconstructed with extra tissue that you have on your body. You need your MHC, I think, to, uh, to stimulate oh, okay. those cells. If those specialized tissues could be transplanted from one person to another, surgeons could potentially transfer functioning eyelids, lips, and other tissues to rebuild a face. Dr. Mathis and others are looking for a way to minimize the amount of immune suppression needed for a transplant. 
The research involves T cells that may function as regulatory cells, helping to stop the rejection process. For example, if a person gets a kidney transplant, cells from, the, from that patient will migrate into the organ. Um, usually they're held at bay by chronic immunosuppression. Uh, but one of the thoughts is that maybe some of these cells that infiltrate in are actually regulatory cells in that they can, re they can sort of tell the other cells not to destroy the organ. And so what we're trying to do is find those cells that are sort of like the policemen and they'll tell the other cells to back off and then you'll get long-term tolerance to the organ and not need chronic immunosuppression. The goal is to be able to trick a patient's immune system into accepting transplanted tissue as its own. Many researchers are working on this challenge, focusing on different areas of the body. Ultimately, I think everyone's goal, whether they're transplanting a kidney, a liver, or a muscle and skin, would be that you could transplant this tissue or organ without any immunosuppression so the patient could get the transplant and move on with their life and not have to deal with uh, chronic uh, medications. <laughs> it's been almost five months since Valerie's mastectomy. She says it was an emotional boost to wake up from surgery and have new breasts already in place. Chemotherapy has delayed the second part of her reconstruction, but she's looking forward to it. I feel that I look good, I, and I feel that I, I just, I can't wait to see the completed product. <laughs> it's not quite finished, so I kind of feel like a Barbie doll right now. <laughs> but, but once it's done, I think it's going to look great. Here he says, do you get for any woman that has to go through a mastectomy or a double mastectomy, this to me is, is the only way to go. <laughs> the expert UW Medicine reconstructive surgery team includes doctors Peter Nelligan, Otway Louie, David Mathis, and Hakeem Saeed. For more information, to make an appointment, or to refer a patient, contact Center for Reconstructive Surgery at www.uwreconsurgery.org or call 206-598-2342.